Chapter 1, Nursing and the Healthcare System. These are the objectives for Chapter 1, uh, Theory and Clinical Practice. So for Theory, we're going to describe Florence Nightingale's influence on nurses' training, explain why nurses, nursing is both an art and a science, define evidence-based practice, and explain why it is important in nursing and trace the growth of nursing in the United States from the Civil War to the present. So for clinical practice, objectives will write, uh, you'll be able to write your own definition of nursing, discuss how the standards of practice for the LPN or LVN are applied in the clinical setting. So nursing in its most basic form has existed since the beginning of time. It has evolved from an informal act of caring for and nurturing others to a more complex scientific-based profession. Uh, the basic tenets of the profession have remained constant. From its infancy, the focus of nursing has been on assisting with meeting basic human needs. And over time, significant changes have occurred to meet the needs of an ever-changing society. Nursing education, practice settings, and nursing roles have changed significantly. Although nursing has come a long way from the day of strictly providing bedside care, it is by no means anywhere near its full maturity. In fact, nursing will continue to change and evolve as the world will continue to change and evolve. And understanding how nursing evolved over time is an important part of assimilating and appreciating what nursing is now. The founder of modern nursing is Florence Nightingale. She developed the first formal training program for nurses. She focused on the role of the nurse in preventing and curing disease through sanitary techniques. Nightingale was responsible for a major reform in hygiene and sanitary practices. Even at this early time in nursing, she used evidence-based principles to guide nursing practices. In the mid-1800s, Florence Nightingale felt a calling as a nurse, and she began to study nursing in Germany. And during the Crimean War, she asked the Secretary of War to allow her to train women to care for the sick and the wounded. And so by cleaning up the wards, improving ventilation, sanitation, and nutrition, she was able to lower the death rate of the soldiers from 60% to 1%. The Nightingale nurses made their rounds after dark with the aid of a lighted oil lamp. And so that's how the lamp became the official symbol of nursing. Just as Florence Nightingale <clears throat> made a significant impact on the course of nursing, so have many other individuals. Um, the evolution of nursing in the United States occurred within the context of wartime, just as was the case during Nightingale's era. Dorothea Dixon, who was not a nurse, is credited with developing the Nurses' Corp of the United States Army. Clara Barton founded the American Red Cross, which played a key role in meeting the healthcare needs of soldiers during the Civil War. We also um, have Mary Brewster, who established the Henry Street Settlement Service in New York City. And so this Henry Street Settlement Service uh, was focused on the health uh, needs of poor people who lived in tenements. And tenements are just basically um, buildings that are shared by multiple individuals, like apartment style uh, type uh, settings. There also, I want to turn your attention to your book on page five, table 1.1. There are several uh, nursing theorists that help to contribute to the nursing profession as well. We won't go through all of them, but let's just look at a few of them here. Virginia Henderson, her goal 
was to help patients gain independence in meeting their needs as quickly as possible. And so she developed a framework based on 14 fundamental needs. Dorothy Johnson, her goal was to reduce stress, allowing the patient to recover as quickly as possible. And she developed a framework for nursing based on seven behavioral subsystems in, the, uh, in an a adaptation model. Let's look at just one more here. Um, Dorothea Oram, the, uh, her goal was to care for and help patients with various needs attain self-care. And so she developed a framework that was based on self-care deficits. And you can just kind of look through there and see some of the other um, theorists that have helped contribute to the nursing profession as we know it today. Many other events have contributed in some way to the involvement of the nursing profession as well. Uh, for example, the first official school of nursing was the Ballard School in New York, which was started by the YWCA in 1892. YWCA was the, uh, or is the Young Women's Christians Association, and they developed a three month course in practical nursing and students were trained to care for infants, children and older adults in the home. Then in 1918, the household nursing school uh, was started in Boston. It was uh, later uh, called the Shepherd Gill School of Practical Nursing. And so basically this school was developed to train nurses how to care for um, sick patients at home. And then also um, Richard Bradley. Richard Bradley was the executor of uh, for Thomas Thompson. He was able to open a practical nursing school in Vermont in 1907. So when Nightingale started her school in England, her training was very well organized. Uh, the classes were held separately from the practical experience. So you just as today, you have clinical and you have um, lecture time. Uh, while the students in the United States had no formal training and they got their training by the physician at the bedside. So they had no formal classes, no formal curriculum or anything like that in the United States. And so um, the advantages of the Nightingale schools having formal training and formal classes that were separate from medicine, um, you had all content, uh, all the content covered was uniform. So all the nurses were learning the same thing um, they were learning how to properly care uh, for patients, nursing, not medicine. Uh, and so the, the information that the, the nurses were gaining was all uniform. So let's look a little more in depth at each of these roles um, when we talk about caregiver. As a caregiver, uh, you're going to implement interventions that will improve, maintain, and restore a person's health. And so interventions are actions that are taken to improve, maintain, or restore health or prevent illness. So you'll learn more about interventions when we talk about the nursing process. But know that intervention is something that you're going to do for your patient to improve uh, their their well-being, to maintain their health, um, or restore their health. And so maybe you might um, perform a dressing change or to improve their, um, their wounds. You might administer main medications to maintain their health or whatnot. Um, a book, an example the book uses is um, you may be assisting a patient with hygiene tasks such as bathing or toothbrushing. And so um, interventions could be a wide variety of things, but they're things that you're going to implement or things that you're going to do to, um, to help your patient. Um, you may take on a role as an educator. And so um, as an LPN, know that you will be reinforcing teaching. 
all initial teaching is done by your registered nurse. Your registered nurse is the person that will do any initial teaching um, for patients. <clears throat> and so as an LPN, you will be allowed to reinforce the teaching that has already been initiated by your registered nurse. And so um, your teaching will be geared to try to maybe promote wellness, prevent illness. So you may be teaching the patient about their disease process, or I should say reinforcing teaching about their disease process, about their medications, about things that they should and shouldn't do when they go home. Maybe they shouldn't be lifting a certain amount of weight or, I mean, so there's a variety of things that you could be helping to reinforce uh, teaching with. You'll also take on a role as a collaborator. And as a collaborator, not only will you be collaborating with your registered nurse or other nurses, you'll be collaborating with the entire healthcare team to pro, um, promote the best care for your patient. So you could be collaborating with the physician. You could be collaborating with the, uh, the therapist, the dietitian. So the entire healthcare team, anybody that is caring for that patient, you could be collaborating with. You'll also take on a role as an advocate. So as an advocate, you should be champion for your patient's best interest. What is in the best interest for your patient? So therefore, you need to know your nursing skills. You need to know your patient and what's going on with your patient so that you can be an advocate. Maybe um, there's something that your patient really wants. or and, and you should be advocating for them, champion for them. Or maybe you know that there's um, a particular medication that makes the patient ill. Advocate for your patient to get what's best for them. So be a champion for your patient and, um, and their uh, best interests. You also, as a LPN, will have a role as a manager. As a manager, um, you can assign minor tasks to um, unlicensed assistive personnel. So unlicensed assistive personnel could be nursing assistants or other ancillary personnel. Maybe it's the housekeeping or something like that. And so that's in Ohio as an LPN. You can um, delegate uh, to other uh, unlicensed assistive personnel. So what is evidence-based practice? So evidence-based practice is using the best research evidence to guide clinical decision making. It helps determine what's best practices. So when we perform our interventions, we should not be performing interventions just because someone told us, oh, this might work or this might be a good idea or I think this might work or whatnot. It should be based on the research. What does the research tell us is the best intervention or the best practice in our particular patient situation. And so evidence-based practice is driven by theory, research, performance improvement, clinical judgment, and patient preferences. So it involves basing nursing implementation on the best evidence available. And so it combines uh, the nurse's clinical judgment and takes into account patient preferences as well but it should be based on what the research said. So for example, years ago, nurses didn't wear gloves, but now the research tells us that anytime we're coming in contact with blood or body fluids, we should be wearing gloves. So that, that's a best practice based on research. And so just keeping in mind, we're uh, going based on what the research says, but we also should be using our own clinical judgment, which you should be gaining. Uh, uh, the more experience you have, the better clinical judgment you'll have. And then you also want to make sure you take into account your patient's um, preferences as well. All right, let's look at question one. Florence Nightingale's beliefs are still the foundation of nursing today. She was responsible for so your answer is going to be two, the belief that continuing education is necessary for nurses. And so Florence Nightingale believed in the value of education for nurses. And so she started the first school of nursing in England and encouraged nurses to continue their education after graduation. Okay, question two, 
The training in the Nightingale schools varied considerably from that of the U.S. nursing schools. Which statement is correct concerning the differences? So your answer here is going to be number four. Instruction was done at the bedside by a physician in the United States. So the training in the Nightingale schools was well organized with classes that were held separately from the practical experience, just as you do today. You have a clinical experience and you have a classroom experience. The United States had no formal classes and no set curricula. And so instruction was accomplished at the bedside by the physician and therefore came from a medical uh, viewpoint versus a nursing viewpoint. Okay, so the Nurse Practice Act provides guidance regarding the legal boundaries of professional nursing practice. So this is where you get your legal boundaries uh, for professional nursing practice. Each individual state determines specific regulatory guidelines for the practice of nursing, including the scope of practice, um, the method of governing, and the nursing education criteria. So every U.S. state and Canadian providence has their own Nurse Practice Act. So you're learning the laws and rules for Ohio. Now, should you, when you graduate and become a, a nurse, should you move to another state um, or Canadian providence, you would need to ner learn their Nurse Practice Act and what those um, they say that you as a nurse or an LPN can do in that, that particular state. So in Ohio, your Nurse Practice Act can be found on Ohio Board of Nursing's website, and I have posted a link to the Ohio Board of Nursing's website for you to go in and look and play around and see what the Nurse Practice Act said. It is important for you to understand what your scope of practice says as a nurse, what you can and cannot do as a nurse. Uh, because if you were delegated something by a RN that you're not allowed to do, then you need to know that's not within my scope of practice and I'm, I'm not able to do that or perform that task. And so the Nurse Practice Act is designed to protect the public and um, define the legal scope of practice. It's not designed to protect you, it's designed to protect the public and define your legal scope of practice. It regulates the practice um, of nursing. Okay. Also, um, within a broader context of law, nursing practice is measured by standards of care. And so nurses can incur legal consequences when it's determined that the nurse did not function within the framework of the Nurse Practice Act or standards of care. So uh, we'll talk more uh, legally about what all these different things mean when we get to the legal chapter, but some of the charges you can occur are assault and battery, defamation of character, fraud, invasion of privacy, false imprisonment, negligence, malpractice, all those things. Like I said, we'll talk more in detail what each one means when we get to the legal chapter. But know that you do have standards of practice as a um, as an LPN. So if you look in your book on page six, box 1.1, there are the standards of practice for a licensed practical or vocational nurse. And so um, we'll look at a few of them. We're not going to go through each one, but make sure you take time and read through each one. But let's just look at a few of them here. Uh, the licensed practical or vocational nurse shall accept assigned responsibilities as an accountable member of the healthcare team. So once you accept an assignment, you are accountable for um, that assignment that you have um, accepted. Uh, shall function within the limits of educational preparation and experience as related to the assigned duties. And so that means you should not be working outside your scope of practice as an LPN. So as an LPN, like I said, you're not allowed to um, push IV meds. You're not allowed to um, administer blood or chemo drugs. And so you cannot function outside your level of education, which is... Um, which your scope of so you need to know what your nurse scope of practice says that you can and cannot do, um, so you don't practice outside those guidelines. 
let's look at another this one more here um so carrying out therapeutic regimens and protocols prescribed by personnel pursuant to authorized state law so um you know if there's a dressing change or if there's a medication that needs to be administered so administering uh those regimens and uh, based on your uh, protocols and uh, what the order says. Um, so make sure you take a look at that and uh, understand what the standards of practice are. And then take a look, um, like I said, on the um, Blackboard, I have posted the Ohio Board of Nursing's website, and you can go to the Nurse Practice Act there and see just some of the things it says um, are in the scope of practice for LPN. Okay, so nursing process. We'll talk a lot more in detail about the nursing process when we get to those chapters. This is just a basic introduction here of what the nursing process is. And you will, uh, throughout nursing school, you will learn more and more about nursing process. You will not get away from the nursing process throughout nursing school and throughout your nursing career. This is um, how we base our care. So basically it's a system, it's an organized, deliberate, systematic way to deliver nursing care. It's how we're going to deliver our nursing care. It's science-based. And so that means it combines, combines the science and the art of nursing. And so it focuses on the patient as an individual. And so the components of the nursing process are assessment, nursing diagnosis, planning, implementation, and evaluation. And a lot of people remember this using um, the acronym ADPI, A-D-P-I-E, ADPI, Assessment, Diagnosis, Planning, Implementation, and Evaluation. Now, for um, LPNs, the, when we talk about the nursing diagnoses, the sole responsibility of developing the nursing diagnosis belongs to the registered nurse. And so sometimes when you see that nursing process, that nursing that for the LPN, that diagnosis piece may not be there because the sole responsibility of the di nursing diagnosis is the registered nurse. However, we teach you as an LPN how to uh, do a nursing diagnosis because you need to understand how to contribute to that part of the nursing process. What if you're assigned a patient and you notice something going on with that patient? You need to be able to go to your nurse and say, uh, I think you need to assess this patient for da 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 possible um, adding a possible nursing diagnosis uh, to the patient's care plan. And so, um, so you still need to understand how it's developed and how uh, what it is and, and whatnot. But like I said, we'll go um, in more detail with the nursing process in a, in a later chapter. Okay, the Nurse Practice Act. The Nurse Practice Act provides guidance regarding the legal boundaries of the professional nursing practice. And so each state, each individual state determines specific regulatory guidelines for the practice of nursing. And so it includes the scope of practice, the method of governing, and um, your nurse, the nursing education criteria that's required. And so it gives you legal boundaries of what you can and cannot do as a nurse, what your legal scope of practice is. You will find the um, LPN and the RN's legal scope of practice as a nurse, so what you can and cannot do. Um, every U.S. state and Canadian province, province has their own Nurse Practice Act. So you're learning the laws and rules for Ohio. So if you graduate, obtain your nursing license and move to another state, then you'll need to understand what their Nurse Practice Act says that you can and cannot do as an LPN. So you can find your Nurse Practice Act for Ohio on Ohio Board of Nursing's website. I've actually posted a link to the Ohio Board of Nursing's website on Blackboard for you to go on and look at and kind of start playing around with and seeing what it says because it's important for you to understand the things that you can and cannot do. 
the Nurse Practice Act is designed to protect the public, not you, but to protect the public and define your legal scope of practice as a, a, as a nurse, whether it be LPN or RN. Also, within a broader context of law, nursing practice is measured by standards of care. And uh, so nurses may incur legal consequences when it's determined that the nurse didn't function within a framework of the Nurse Practice Act or standards of care. And so we'll go into um, uh, these legal terms here in a later chapter when we get to the legal chapter. But some of the charges that you may incur include assault and battery, defamation of character, fraud, invasion of privacy, false imprisonment, negligence, malpractice. Um, those are just some of the, the charges that can be incurred. But like I said, we'll go more in detail of what each of those means in a later chapter. I want to turn your attention to page six of your book, box 1.1, and you'll find the standards of practice for uh, licensed practical and vocational nurse. You have uh, 17 standards of national practice of nursing. So we're not going to go through each of these, but let's just look at a couple of them here. Um, the licensed practical or vocational nurse shall function within the limits of educational preparation and experience as related to the assigned duties. And so basically that means you should not be practicing outside your scope of practice. So it's important that you understand what your scope of practice is as an LPN, because if you're delegated a task by a registered nurse, that's not within your scope of practice. You need to be able to say that's not within my scope of practice and I can't do that. You know, for instance, as an LPN, you can't um, push IV medication. You can't administer blood. You can't administer chemo drugs. So you need to know what your scope of practice is so that you um, are sure that you're um, functioning within your educational limits. Um, also functioning within your um, experience, right? So um, there may be some things that you are legally allowed to do, but have you had the experience or have you done that in practice? And so you want to ensure that you're uh, knowledgeable if there's a task that you've never done before and you're not familiar with it, then get someone to help you and train you on how to do that task before uh, attempting to perform it independently as well. Um, let's look at another one here. Um, assisting the patient and family with activities of daily living and encouraging self-care as appropriate. So as an LPN, um, you may have to assist with tasks of daily living. And so, um, you know, anything that um, the aides can do. Um, as the LPN, you should be, uh, you may be delegated those tasks as well and, and, and need to perform that. Apply knowledge and skills to promote and maintain health, to prevent disease and disability, and to optimize functional capabilities of an individual patient. So you need to be knowledgeable so that you can apply skills to um, you know, help prevent disease and maintain health and things like that. So just take a look at that. Um, like I said, that's on page six. Make sure you understand those standards. Also take a look at the Ohio Board of Nurses website with on Blackboard. And uh, the link is on Blackboard so that you can kind of start to familiarize yourself with the Nurse Practice Act. All right, the nursing process. The nursing process is something that you are going to need throughout your nursing school career as well as when you become a nurse throughout your nursing nursing career not only nursing school but your nursing career as, a, as well and so um basically it's how we deliver care it's an organized deliberate systematic way to deliver nursing care and so um, it's science-based and so that means it combines science and the art of nursing and it focuses on the patient as an individual. So the components, um, and we'll go in a lot more detail in some later chapters about the nursing process and each of these components. Um, but it encompasses assessment, nursing diagnosis, planning, implementation, and evaluation. 
Now, sometimes when you see the nursing process for the LPN, you might not see the nursing diagnosis piece. The nursing diagnosis piece is the sole responsibility of the registered nurse. And so um, that's why sometimes as an LPN, you might not see that piece. But we teach you the nursing diagnosis piece because you need to understand how to contribute to it. What if you're assigned a patient and you notice something new is going on with that patient? You need to be able to go to your registered nurse and say, hey, I think something's going on and you need to assess this patient for XYZ nursing diagnosis. Um, yes, it would be her response or his or her responsibility to um, develop that nursing diagnosis and add it to the care plan, but you should be able to contribute to that process. A lot of people uh, use the acronym ADPI to try to remember it. ADPI, A-D-P-I-E. A for assessment, D for diagnosis, P for planning, I for implementation, and E for evaluation. Um, but those are the components. But like I said, we will go much more into detail with the nursing process in another uh, in later chapters. All right, so practical nursing was created to fill a gap that was left by nurses who enlisted in the military services during uh, World War II. And so practical or vocational nursing programs generally take anywhere from 12 to 18 months to complete. And so uh, they can be offered in vocational schools, hospitals, um, proprietary schools, which are for-profit. For um, they can be offered at community colleges, a variety of different um, places. And so when you graduate, you can't automatically call yourself um, a licensed practical nurse, right? Graduation doesn't equate to licensed practical nurse. You have to pass the NCLEX, which is also known as the National Council of Licensure Examination. You have to pass that before you can call yourself a nurse. Um, once you are officially a nurse, you can provide direct patient care under the supervision of a registered nurse, um, a physician, a dentist, uh, an advanced practice registered nurse, a physician assistant, or um, even a podiatrist, you can provide um, care under any either of those individuals. Okay, so after you become a, a, a licensed practical nurse, um, you don't have to stop there. You can go on to become a registered nurse. So there's a lot of different paths that you can take to become a registered nurse. Um, there are diploma programs that are hospital-based, although um, the diploma programs are starting to phase out a little bit more. Um, but you do have a few of those left. Um, the ADN associate degree uh, program is a two-year program that you can take to become a registered nurse. Or you can take have become uh, have a uh, obtain a BSCN, which is a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, which is a four-year degree. And so um, you know, as a registered nurse, you can provide care at the bedside, or you can provide care in the community. You can su supervise others, um, you know, as they're managing multiple patients or whatnot. So there's a lot of different um, things that you can do um, as a registered nurse, you know, more different things you can do as a registered nurse. Okay, so like I said, you can go on to be a registered nurse. Um, so you can obtain your bachelor's as a registered nurse, uh, but then you can go on for a master's degree, which is another two years, um, or you can go on for a doctorate degree. The two main doctorate degrees for nurses are your DMP or your PhD in nursing. A, P a PhD in nursing is considered a research expert. And a DMP or a doctor of nursing practice is considered a clinical expert. And so um, those are your terminal degrees um, for nursing. And so um, you can also become uh, a nurse practitioner. And so a nurse practitioner at this time uh, requires a minimum of a master's degree. And so as a nurse practitioner, 
um, you can specialize in a variety of different areas. You can specialize in family practice, pediatrics, maternity, psychiatry, adult health nursing, or geriatrics. And once you're licensed as um, a nurse practitioner, you're more independent than, uh, than a registered nurse. And so, um, you know, you can go on to do, um, you know, limitless things, um, you know, uh, if you decide to further your education. Now, for um, licensed vocational nurse or licensed practical nurse, um, after you complete the uh, curriculum and licensure, you can uh, seek some certification in pharmacology, long-term care, IV therapy. Now, when you graduate uh, this particular program, you will you know, be pharmacology certified, able to pass medications, and you will be IV therapy certified as well. So you will uh, complete your IV therapy course in term two, and then um, you will start to have uh, IV therapy practice in clinical settings. And so once you, you know, get the practice, complete the course successfully and get the practice in the clinical, um, that information is forwarded to the program director who then, once you graduate, um, will send that information to the Board of Nursing. And once you obtain, uh, pass the NCLEX and obtain your license, you will be uh, IV certified at that point. All right, so there are various systems for delivery of nursing care. Um, so for example, we have uh, functional nursing care. And so um, this was the first care delivery system for practical nurse. And so under functional nursing care, um, the nursing care was uh, rather fragmented. And so based, because basically it's based on the function that you perform or the task that you perform. For example, you might have an LPN that's administering all oral medications, another LPN that's at uh, performing all the, the treatments. Then another, um, a registered nurse that's doing all the IV medications. So it's very fragmented because you can't go to one nurse to find out all the information you need for one particular patient. And so um, healthcare organizations have tended to move away from this type of system because it was um, so fragmented. So Another um, type of um, delivery of nursing care is uh, team nursing. So in team nursing, you have a registered nurse team leader who coordinates the care for, uh, for a group of patients. And so, uh, for example, you might have an LPN and a, a a nursing assistant that are assigned to this group of patients, another LPN and a nursing assistant assigned to another group of patients and so on and so forth. And the RN would be the team leader or charge nurse of, uh, of that, you know, uh, group uh, of, of, of all those patients. Okay, so another type of delivery of nursing care is total patient care. So with total patient care, you have one nurse uh, will carry out all nursing functions for the patient, including medication administration. So this type of nursing care is less fragmented because you have one nurse that you can go to um, and she, has, she or he has all the information um, that you need. And so this type of uh, delivery of care system might be seen in ICU or intensive care units because you have just the one nurse that's providing all the nursing needs um, for that particular patient. And yet another type of delivery of nursing care is primary nursing. So with primary nursing, one nurse assumes responsibility for a patient's plan of care for the length of stay in a particular area. So you might see this in, say, a home care setting. You'll have the registered nurse that'll go in and develop the plan of care and coordinate all the care for that particular uh, 
uh, patient. Now, that's not to say that other nurses don't come in to care for that patient, but the registered nurse that developed the plan of care is responsible for coordinating all the services um, for that patient and overseeing their um, that episode of care for that particular patient. So as an LPN, um, there's a variety of settings that uh, you can work. Uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, you're familiar with long-term care um, or rehabilitation, but that's not the only place. You know, LPNs, there's a variety of different places LPNs can work. Um, you, there's LPNs in various hospitals, um, subacute extended care like the long-term care. Um, assisted living, assisted living, these individuals don't necessarily need to be in a home, uh, a long-term care, but they might need some extra help with housekeeping, preparing med medications, and maybe they need a little help with some of the nursing care services. Um, maybe they need somebody to set up their uh, their meds for the week or, or something, just some additional assistance that they might need. Um, also, physicians' offices, LPNs can work in physicians' offices as well. So some other settings, home health agencies. Um, now, home health agencies, I know a variety of home health agencies that will hire a LPN or hire nurses, period, um, upon graduation and successfully passing the NCLEX. However, I don't recommend as a new graduate you work for a home health agency because, um, now this is just my personal opinion, but um, I would say get at least a year experience under your belt because as the um, the nurse out there, yes, you have your um, RN supervisor or the physician that you can call um, for assistance or whatnot, but they're looking at you, you're their eyes and ears to tell them uh, what is going on so that they can they can guide you through the process and as a new individual if you don't know all the things that you should be assessing or all the things you should be telling them so that they can properly guide you it could be a little bit difficult in that situation so that's just my personal opinion but um, as a new grad who has recently passed um, his or her NCLEX you are able to um, work in a health health agency um, also neighborhood emergency centers and so that's just minor emergency care um, that's provided to patients in the community. All right, some other places, um, correctional facilities um, and correctional facilities. So that's maybe your, your jails or whatnot, LPNs. I've had nurses that, um, LPNs that have, you know, worked in the uh, their, their, their correctional facility in their counties or whatnot. And so you might provide physical exams, administer medications, do different treatments or things like that. Um, as an LPN, you can work as a school nurse, you can work in surgical centers with um, same day surgeries or whatnot as well. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is um, uh, diagnosis related groups or DRGs. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of that, but they're DRGs or diagnosis related groups is what it's called. So in hospital, um, DRGs were created by Medicare in 1983 to help contain rising costs of um, rising healthcare costs. And so with the DRG system, that means the hospital receives a set amount of money for a hospitalized patient with a certain diagnosis. So say for instance, let's say I have a person with hypertension, which is high blood pressure. So I have a patient with hypertension that comes in uh, that needs to be treated. So this is just, this is, I'm just throwing out numbers here. Let's just say for hypertension, the hospital gets $5,000 to treat that patient. So if the hospital can um, treat that patient in two days and discharge them and only spend two thousand dollars to treat that patient they get to pocket the other three thousand however if it takes them ten days to treat that same patient and cost them ten thousand dollars then they're going to be out of pocket five thousand dollars so the drg is um 
says you get this set amount of money and if it costs you less okay you keep the money if it costs you more then you got to pay that so that's why hospitals are looking to try to uh, provide the best possible care with the least amount of cost uh, so that they don't you know end up being out of pocket for uh, extra cost okay so you have different levels of care such as preventative or primary secondary um, and tertiary so if you turn your attention to pages 10 and 11 in your book on page 10 you have figure 1.10 and page 11 you have box 1.2 that gives you examples of what is included in um, each of these areas so so um, we talk about preventative or primary care preventative or primary care are things that you do to um, promote wellness, promote wellness and prevent illness. So if you look there, those things might include exercising, um, doing your well baby care checkups, doing your prenatal care, uh, smoking sensation uh, programs, fire prevention classes, um, annual physical checkups. So things that we're doing to promote wellness and prevent it, it illness. Secondary, secondary is acute care. So secondary is acute care. So that might include um, emergency care. That might include having a radiologic procedure or lab or diagnostic test or whatnot, or some type of surgical procedure or things like that. And then tertiary, um, when we talk about tertiary, that includes restorative and continuing care. So things included in that could be long-term care. Um, chronic, I have a chronic disease, and so I'm doing things to manage that chronic disease, um, living in a, assisted living or things like that, hospice or palliative care. Those would be included in tertiary. Okay, so there are various um, health systems. And so one such health system is a HMO, also called a health maintenance organization. And so with a, um, a HMO, they enroll patients for a set fee each month. And so um, with a HMO, um, there's a limited network of physicians. So a limited network of physicians, hospitals, and other providers that you can choose from. If you go outside that network, then the cost to you will be much higher. Um, out-of-pocket costs. So the goal is to keep patients healthy and out of the hospital is what they're trying to do. If you do need to be referred um, to, you know, for whatever, if you got to be referred for diagnostic tests, hospitalization, even emergency room visits, um, a consultation with a specialist or whatever, then that referral has to come from your primary care physician. If the primary care physician does not uh, make the referral, then uh, there could be some additional costs uh, to you as the patient. Another healthcare um, system is a PPO, also called a preferred provider or preferred provider organization. And so PPOs offer their services at discounted fees. So that allows insurance company to have low premiums. So in a PPO, patients have a larger pool of patients, I'm sorry, a larger pool of um, physicians that they can um, choose from, you know, versus with a, a, a HMO when, you know, that, that pool of individuals you can choose from is very limited. And so large businesses and insured, uh, insured groups can contract with, um, with PPOs. All right, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Affordable Care Act, some of you may know it as um, Obamacare because um, President Obama signed this um, act into law. And so this, um, the Affordable Care Act was established, the, the, the purpose of it being established was to increase the number of insured people and decrease the, um, the barriers that these individuals were having um, to being insured. 
so the goal was to get more people insured and decrease um, any barriers that they might have um, to be insured. Now, the act it was thousands of pages, so we couldn't go into every provision, but I just want to highlight a few things here. Um, things that this uh, act implemented were to try to prevent barriers, um, preventing, uh, so insurance companies couldn't deny you for pre-existing conditions. So uh, prior to this, you know, insurance companies could deny you for pre-existing conditions. Um, it expanded Medicaid also so that what, what that means is it increased the poverty level so that more individuals could uh, qualify for Medicaid. It allowed parents to keep their children on their insurance until the child turned 26 years of age. Um, so these are some things that, you know, it implemented. And so um, it did help to decrease the number of individuals that were uninsured. It didn't completely eliminate it, but it did significantly decrease the number of individuals that were uninsured as a result of this. Uh, now, when the Trump administration came in, there were some things that originally they wanted to completely eliminate it altogether, but they didn't have anything to replace it with. And so as a result, they couldn't completely eliminate it. However, they did um, delete some of the things. Uh, one of the requirements of the Affordable Care Act was it had to you had to be insured. And if you weren't insured when you did your taxes, you had to pay uh, a small fee for not being assured. Another thing that the Trump administration eliminated was um, there were subsidies. The Affordable Care Act was implemented in phases. And so one of the phase was to provide subsidies for individuals that couldn't afford insurance. So maybe your elderly individual that couldn't afford insurance, there was a subsidy to help them pay for um, insurance. And so the Trump administration eliminated that subsidy as well. So like I said, the um, uh, act itself was is, is thousands of pages. And so we couldn't go all into detail, but I just wanted to highlight it here for you, a few of the things that um, that it did and does. And so the idea of the Affordable Care Act was to promote wellness um, with individuals. Um, one of the other things you might have noticed when the Affordable Care Act was implemented, that if you go for, say, your annual physical exam, you didn't have those co-pays. And so if they could get people to the hospital or to the doctor's office, I should say, to, um, for those physical exams, the idea is maybe we could prevent some illnesses down the road and uh, save on health care costs in, uh, in the long run. Okay, question three. Assisting a patient with daily hygiene needs is an example of... So the answer here is intervention. And so remember, caregiving skills are interventions that are aimed at restoring and maintaining a person's health. And so interventions are actions taken to improve, maintain, and restore health and prevent illness. All right, question four. As the role of a practical nurse expands, employment opportunities have increased as well. All of the following are appropriate practice settings for an LPN except the answer is three. So practical nurses work in the areas where there is supervision by a registered nurse, a physician, a dentist or of some sort, right? And so in uh, community nursing and public health nursing, um, presently, those are primarily the arenas of the registered nurse 